All right, welcome to our July 16th DevSync meeting, 2020. So, um, what should we talk about today? All right, let's just jump into the uh, Jira uh, sprints and uh, see what we've got. All right. everybody see my Jira screen? All right. Uh, since Charlie is not here, I, Derek, you want to give an update on project rollover prototypes? Yes. So uh, we're just basically continuing to print parts. And as I get them done, I bring them to Charlie and he does the post-processing. Uh, so as of right now, we're about 70, 75% done with the prints. Uh, I anticipate being fully done by uh, the, w the weekend, uh, by the end of the weekend. So Charlie's been uh, working through building those audio chambers um, and just cleaning up all the prints that I give him. So yeah, basically everything's still in progress. Um, but yeah, we should have everything printed by, by the the end of the weekend so and then the goal is to get charlie in hopefully tomorrow but at the latest on monday and we can start cranking these out so i think we can ship josh should ask to ship five to set a hard deadline i think we can do that a week from uh today i think is pretty realistic for that um yeah so that's that's where we're at there Okay, I'll think it's still in the right place. Yeah. All right. Mark two first prototype. Yeah, so we moved to come a few things moved over here. So the system blocking update um, uh, as done, we've got the um, <clears throat> The, uh, uh, the review of the repo and the post of the blog or the blog post and um, what I've seen, it's been pretty pretty well received. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of little going back and forth on that. We kind of, I think we talked about consolidating the repo. So we got that all consolidated into one Mark II repo. And so within that, we will have um, all the Mark II related projects. So that includes the off-the-shelf design, which is what we're calling, um, kind of retroactively calling the design that we've been working with, the one that uses the re-speaker microarray. Uh, so that's abbreviated as OTS in the repo. And then moving forward, we'll call the new design that we've been working on with Kevin, the Mark II uh, RPI for Raspberry Pi dev kit. So that's that's what we're calling the, the project we're working on right now. And that's all under hardware dash micro dash mark two. Um, so yeah, working to be a little better about keeping everything in one place. Um, but yeah, as far as day to day, I'm still working on the industrial design. Um, I basically really kind of just started that a, a couple days ago as we had been kind of going back and forth on. Um, little tweaks here and there, moving buttons around to accommodate a uh, different connector, a cheaper connector. And, you know, just now that it's 95% uh, solidified, we might get some good suggestions from the community and may change things a little bit. Um, I can make some more progress on that. And um, also kind of, you know, told the community we want to share um, a good update on that soon. So. I will do my best to make some really good headway there. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of where I'm at on that. And then, so Kevin's basically, um, you know, if we, if we get some feedback uh, from the community, like some, you know, engineers take a look and tell us we need to change a few things or we'll make those things happen. But um, 
until you know as we're waiting for that type of stuff or well, basically he's he's kind of a holding pattern all right um yeah oh the other thing is we got a fdm printer on the way we've kind of been uh without an fdm printer here in Moritz for a little while and i know the a uh, couple of community members have been working on FTM versions of the over the shelf or off the shelf design, um, but it, we want to um, be able to get some support there on the the new design as well. Um, so being able to do that with the community is going to be beneficial. So that, we've got that on order. It should be for next week. <laughs> Did you see that new Moira design? What's that? Did you see the new Moira design from the community? Just on Moira? the printing front? I have not. Yeah. Check it out. It's on um, the forums and Reddit. Uh, someone's created a, a whole new design. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah there, there was one that was created by a member. Um, it was basically kind of like a... a flat sided kind of version of um, the original over the off the shelf design. Um, now this is this is more echoish in appearance, but they do I do need you to an action item on that is that they they asked me a couple questions that I can't answer. They wanted to do a domed top and if you remember the the original uh, version of the Mark II was curved on top and we got rid of that because of something to do with noise cancellation and like channel shape and stuff. Um, and so they wanted an answer as to why that is. And then they had one other question that I couldn't answer because it was an industrial design thing. Can you, can you reach in and answer his questions on that, on that forum yeah, post? Okay. Yeah. I'm taking a look at now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not terribly domed. It's got a flattish top, but yeah, um, there's some things. looks like you might be trying to do an upward facing speaker, which would be probably not the most beneficial for um, barge in because it's you know, firing right at the microphone. Um, but yeah, I'll get in there and, and, uh, and make some comments. It looks cool. All right, that's, I think that's about it for me. All right, moving on. Fix existing bugs. <clears throat> um, so, I want to go through the done column here because I know I've completed a few of these. <clears throat> um, updating the Mark II uh, Kiwi image to Mycroft 22.4. Um, I did find out what that issue was, uh, Chris, as far as um, you know why we weren't getting past the first screen. So that is actually done and working. So I closed that one. Uh, the cursor visible, um, that was a one line fix. It was pretty easy to do. I've, so I got that one fixed. Uh, the skills loading progress bar off screen, I made a small coding change to the Kiwi code and that has gone away. So that is good. Um, I've rebooted my device like a hundred times in the last couple of days just to, <laughs> just to make sure it was kind of an intermittent thing. So I did a whole bunch of reboots to uh, make sure it doesn't re reoccur and I, no, I haven't seen it. But, um, and hey, I've got a request. I've, I've got a request for a, a feature. Um, sorry, if, I, I do want to get it in there while I'm thinking about it. Um, can we have a, a can, can we add a cron job to that image that cycles it? Um, let's start with every uh, seven days. So let's just cycle it on Sundays at midnight local. Um, but, you know, at Wicked, I, I have a lot of experience running stuff that's got to be high availability. And what we found with with Linux was we could keep equipment up and running for, you know, in some cases a decade if we just cycled it every every week. Like it, it just stops the lockups and, you know, equipment just needs to be, you know, as much as I would love to have something that's so elegantly designed that it never needs to be rebooted, especially with this COTS version, we just, you know, as Michael pointed out, like voltage rises and all this other stuff, 
there's just enough that we're not controlling or we don't understand that, that we're going to run into periodic issues. And the one that's been sitting on my counter forever, you know, when I encountered problems with it, a reboot usually fixed it. So we may be able to put a lot of the potential bugs that we're going to be facing to bed by simply adding a cron job where we, we just cycle the damn thing once every seven days. Okay. I mean, it's not a hard thing to do. I can create a ticket for that. Um, do that pretty quickly and put it into the image. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a good feature to put into the um, the backlog, but we should discuss it more before actually implementing it. There's some other repercussions okay. there. And also probably make it configurable, right? Yeah, that, yeah, that would be one of the issues. <laughs> All right, I'll add it to the, uh, to the backlog then. Uh, so right now I'm, you know, I was also looking at um, this freeze, uh, the, the whoosh bar being stuck when we connect to internet. Um, I think that was also fixed when I did the uh, progress bar fix. So I have not seen that since either. So I'm probably going to go ahead and close that issue. Um, if anybody, you know, I'll, I'll keep rebooting it often. And if I ever see it, I'll, I'll take a look. But um, this is MC108. Yeah. Have you tried having internet problems? Well, like, for example, you know, using the wrong password or something? I have not. Yeah. I'd, but I I'd... think that's a bigger problem because if we have the wrong password, there's not really a, a way that I know. That, I don't know that we've coded the Mark II right now to identify the fact that it can't connect to the internet and then try to reconnect. Like mm. the Mark one does that by default. If you change your, um, you know, gotcha. your Okay. So we're not trying to solve this problem then because the whole boot up connect to the internet service is still, uh, it's still an outstanding yeah. to do. Yeah. That can okay. be included in that particular right. effort, but yeah, then, that's something we should consider. Gotcha. Uh, Gaz, we also closed a couple other issues, right? With, uh, I know I did some PRs reviews this week too. Yeah, yeah, so I merged a few things um, from the plan skill and, well, yeah, uh, a few skills. Um, and uh, let me just check close PRs that I'll give you quickly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there's fixes to the installer skill, designer skill, um, the judge skill, uh, um, because that had a random bug in it. Uh, yeah, the, um, the news and, and singing Hey, uh, still have not had any um, any breakthroughs on. Um, so that's where the, the stop message is, is timing out in the VoIP comp test. Um, so I'm still stuck on that. Uh, the skill date time, uh, that's the one where I, I just put in that random 10 second sleep at the start of um, before actually kicking off all the tests. Um, thing happens so infrequently that it's hard to know whether that is definitively fixing it or not, but it, it has never happened. I've been just running that, um, that fork periodically to try and get it to trigger to know that it's not working, but <laughs> it's never failed with, the, with that 10 seconds leap in there. So I'm, I'm thinking that Maybe we just merge that and then uh, see if if it ever reappears, then we can pull it out again. But um, at the moment, that seems like. So is that a hack to core or is that a, a, a hack to the test suite? A hack to the test suite. OK. It essentially sleeps leaves the test suite for 10 seconds after it thinks it's ready to start. Um, it sleeps for 10 seconds and then does the first test. 
Okay, and that's because if you if it starts too quickly, the skill date time test sometimes just fails. It's because the very first skill date time test sometimes fails, and I haven't been able to work out why. Um, and so my assumption is that it's because something isn't ready in time, but I haven't I haven't figured out what that is. Hmm. But the fact that it was the first test in the entire test suite just sort of sent me in that direction, and then I haven't been able to get it to re-trigger with the sleep in there. So that is that is the entirety of the information that I'm going on, you know. Gotcha. I haven't well, spent, I haven't, yeah. Uh, so do we have a a uh, procedure or a, a default, you know, sort of way of marking things that are hacks? Uh, rather than actual fixes? Just for the comment. Uh, okay. Is the usual. Yeah. All right. What do you just put in, like, hack in capital letters or something? Or what do you, how do you do it here? Yeah, uh, we should probably make something we can search the code base for. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, and we'll, you could reference uh, the Jira ticket, the time, too. Most of the time, they're, they're um, release-based. And so, you know, we... we can generally search for like um, comments that uh, include the next major release tag, like you know 2008. What do we need to do for 2008? Because mm -hmm. there'll there'll generally be things like pull this out at the next major release. You know, once everything else is is in place. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we can just do a, a hash to do. But, you know. Okay. Pretty classic. Yeah, and and reference the ticket number there, and I wouldn't close that ticket until you've yeah. actually solved the problem because you're probably right. It probably is some service not being ready in time, and that is definitely something we'll want to fix for production software. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, but I mean, if you're just wasting time beating your head against it for now, uh, I don't know how. And you've got something that seems to sort of fix it, and it's only a. Test yeah, sweet problem. I think yeah, I think this is just the, the easiest yeah. way to validate whether this does fix it or not because it'll it'll then get run, you know, many, many, many times per day. And so if we never see it again right. for the next two weeks, then I can come back and, and dig into okay, what is that actual thing now that we've isolated where the problem exists. Right. Okay. Cool. Uh, all right, well, I'll make that one then um, and put a comment in and, and leave the ticket open and come back to it in two weeks. Uh, but yeah, I haven't gotten to a lot more. I spent a lot of time this week on the uh, that Marcy repo and comms and stuff, so. Okay. Um, something else I wanted to talk about before Ken gives his precise update is SEL 38. Um, Giz and I have had a little bit of back and forth on this one. So when you try to create an account um, for an email address that already exists on our system, uh, you get a, um, a 500 error and you also get uh, a message on your screen um, that says account could not be created and it's an error message. Um, initially, we thought that this was a good thing. I mean, the 500 may not be the best return code for it, but we thought it was a good thing because we wanted the error, error message not to say something like this email address already has an account in case somebody is phishing for accounts. Um, so Gaz pointed out it probably was probably a good a good solution to this problem, which is to be better about sending emails to people when they try to access their accounts. Um, and this would be one case where you know you tried someone tried to create an account that uses your email. Either it's a warning to them that something bad's happening or a warning to them that hey, you already have an account. Let maybe change your password. Um, so I guess my question is, do we want to close this 
as um, you know works as designed, and then have another ticket that um, deals with what happens when you try to sign up for an account with an existing email address, or do we want to just repurpose this ticket? Do we care? Uh, well, yeah, if it works as designed, then let's just close that and mark it and make a new ticket to design a better system. Is there a okay. that an error code that we can put out there? I'm just like wondering, you know, if, if there was an issue in the system and people are getting, like, it would be hard to know, is this a 500 error, genuine 500 error or an, uh, you know, engineered one? Yeah, why don't we why don't we look at how other you know companies that have larger security budgets are dealing with this question? We see to go into a few different company, you know, Reddit or whatever, and make this attempt and see how they how they are handling it. Um, and then you know if we agree with their thinking, um, you know, handle it that way. I would argue that this is a rate limit thing, but you know the the. The easy way to handle it is to to throw the message that says you already have an account, you know, and then as as Chris says, send that account an email saying somebody tried to access your account, uh, and then restrict the number of attempts that anybody can make on that page, you know, by one every five seconds or you know something. But but even then, it would, you know. If we're providing feedback, you already have an account. Somebody could set up something that's low and slow and just does it once every five seconds and just start cycling through popular account names or popular usernames. So anyway, summary of that is let's mm. go see how other folks are doing it. And if we like their ideas, let's steal them. Yeah, so that was why I was sort of suggesting like from the front end UI, this email process is exactly the same for the person you, like trying to sign up for the account. It's exactly the same whether the email address exists or not. So there's no way that someone can script and automatically, you know, check whether an, an email address exists because to them it just looks like, oh yeah, I'm getting my verification email. Um, but yeah, in in terms of the the different error code, I just meant like I, I agree. I think this is a much bigger ticket. And we can um, uh, that needs to to be its own ticket and its own task. Um, but I just wondered if we could quickly switch that error code so that we know whether or not it's, it's a, a real error or not. Um, I mean, so the suggestion I had in the ticket here is a, is a 400 bad request, maybe. Um, usually that means a malformed request, but um, I don't think there's really, you know, at, at some point we might be able to put like a, an error message in even the 500 code that says why it failed, or not, well, not why it failed, but that wasn't really a problem. Um, I mean, in, in, in general, um, most people aren't gonna get past, you know, the idea that there's a, a pop-up thing on the window that said they couldn't create their account. You know, we have a lot of special, special users now that can get to those 500 errors and know and try to dig into what happened for us, but generally people aren't going to be seeing the 500 error. They're just going to see the, the error that comes up on the screen. Um, so, I mean, I, we, I could certainly look into that as a as a stopgap ish, just to not make it not a 500. So, to be clear, this is an issue with our current GUI, our the Selene backend GUI, right? It's not a API or anything like that that we're having trouble with. Yeah, you know, well, it's the API that's returning the the 500, which is an internal server error. Mm -hmm. um, and then the the UI uh, translates that and puts up a little snack bar that says an error occurred creating your account. So mm -hmm. most users will see the snack bar and not look any further. Right. Except when you're calling support. <laughs> um, but uh, the person who presented this issue. Um, New enough to go into the browser um, JavaScript uh, console and see what happened. Um, mm. It's all 500 error. So, but but the but, but, but kind of I think where Gez was coming from is how do you differentiate that from the back end API being broken? 
Because this adds when you when you you know responding responding to the query, some people like sometimes uh, people are very adamant that they have never signed up for Microsoft, um, and it must be a, a real genuine error. Uh, and you know you go back and forth a bunch more times, and then they realize that oh wait, they finally did follow the instructions that I sent them the first time and tried to reset the password, and everything's fine now. Um, so it's more just like how do we shortcut that? <laughs> um, so if there was a different error code, I could be like, well, I can guarantee you if you're getting a mail for, well, I can be very confident if you're getting a, a 400 error or something, then um, then that's because you already have an account or someone else has created an account, you know, using your email address or something, you know. I mean, it's, so basically, I mean, it is really works as designed, right? The It is designed such that People will get a cryptic error message, so they'll reach out to customer support, and then Gez gets a personal email. Like that's the <laughs> system that Chris bears, you know, describing, right? And so that's how yeah. that's how it's working. Yes, yeah, so it, works, it works as intended. <laughs> so it sounds like uh, Gez does not like this system and wants a new system designed. <laughs> he he doesn't like how it was intended to work. <laughs> Right. Yeah, the problem with doing like a 400 is there's other things that could cause a 400, right? Okay, well, like let's... Yeah. So, so, hey, just hey, turn a regular 200 and say, that counts already in use. <laughs> I don't get it. Well, because then you, if somebody looks in the, in the console, they'll see that, and then they'll know that I mean, that's the whole reason this is the way it is now is because we don't want people knowing that they found an account that exists. Well, all right. I mean... Um, yeah. Security through security is not generally a good idea. Amazon will tell you flat out I mean, that account's already in use. Yeah, that, but that's half the battle. So, like, half the internet, you know, has, you know, ex extensive password reuse, right? So they, they may have a strong password, but they use the same password across 9,000 different sites. And so once the hacker has identified that that email address has an account on our system, they can load one of these, you know, multi-gigabit password files that have been hacked from Yahoo and whoever else, find that email address and say, oh, his, his password at Yahoo was, you know, whatever, one, two, three, four, five, bang. And then they try that on our system and now they're in, right? And the, you know, the, the piece of information that they needed to close that loop was whether or not the account even existed. And so the, you know, the solution to that is to not communicate to random hacker when they try to put in an account that the account already exists in the system. Or as, you know, as I was suggesting, we rate limit it and say you're only allowed to make a certain number of attempts. And um, as Chris Vayer pointed out, just send the user an email and say, hey, like somebody just tried to log in with your assistant, with your, with your credentials. Yeah. Okay. So we're back to the original answer, which is works is designed. We need a new ticket to create a new system. Okay. Correct. <laughs> All right. I will close this one then and uh, take Chris's comment to start um, in this ticket to start another one. So, yeah, I mean, guys, I don't know how much of a pain this is for you, but yeah. Okay. So we've already spent too much time on it. All right. Moving on. <laughs> I was going to say, we probably spent too much time on it already. Apologies. And apologies to everyone listening after the fact. <laughs> we'll, we're, we'll, we'll get better. All right. Uh, so I'm probably going to start working on these two uh, volume settings. I found some stuff in the Mark II, um, Mark II Pi image information in GitHub and how they built the old Mark II. And there was some commands in there. Um, hey, Ken, can you mute? Oh, is that right? Sure. Uh, there, yeah, there's some, some commands in there I'm going to try that hopefully will address these two issues. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to work on that next uh, and then move down the list, I guess. Uh, Ken, precise update. Um, is there a way for me to share like a file with everybody? I tried dragging and dropping; it doesn't seem to work. I, How do I share a file in you chat? Mean like an image? Yeah. Well, I mean, you can definitely share your screen. Well, that's what I was trying to avoid. But... Ah. 
Okay, I'll just share okay. my screen. This is fine. All right, no. Hold on. You can drop it in matter mode, but yeah, Google Chat doesn't let you do files. There, I've uh, oh, this is this I've obscured the the, uh, the recording yeah. until you uh, can guarantee you're not showing your password on the screen that you're sharing. All right. Uh, yeah, I don't know if this is as great as I had hoped. Can Can you see that at all? Yeah. I can I see a great screen. Screen. I can shut off one of these monitors. I think that's part of the problem. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. So. Uh, you have before you a um, set of test results from some models I built. Uh, so the Ken test model, the, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, the hyperparameter being uh, moved here or modified here is the epic. And so what this means is Ken test 60 ran for 60 epics. Ken test 600 ran for 600 epics. 3K, 3,000, and 6K, 6,000. And then here is the resultant uh, values or accuracy levels based upon two or three different test data sets. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, looks like 6K is the winner. Yeah, but what's interesting is look at the male contribs down at 3K. So it's almost like you reach a point of diminishing returns somewhere around there. You get a little bit better performance um, if you go to 6K. But that's just to show you some experimentation. And the model I would probably give to initially would be the Ken test 6K. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, another sort of yeah. Yeah. If you're just cycling through tests, you can do 3K and do it in half the amount of time. And then when you find the parameters that you're really looking for, then you can bump it up for the final yeah, model. Is that I would, yeah, I would say that's fair. I'm going to stop presenting, by the way. Um, yeah, I think that's fair. I've been looking at, um, obviously, <laughs> getting a little more knowledgeable on... Uh, the internals of precise than I had expected. So I've been actually looking at trying to identify its hyperparameters, which is not a trivial issue. They're spread out across a lot of different places um, and trying to figure out which ones are gonna be the biggest bang for the buck and actually some choices on some functions that are being used for loss and um, gradient and stuff like that. So. I don't know where I'm at on hyperparameters yet. Um, I know that um, probably an exhaustive um, grid approach is not going to be the best approach. And I think some of these, there's some commonsensical things that can be done, like batch sizes to powers of two and things like that. So uh, the bottom line is I'm working on that in the background. I'll probably build some models this weekend using TensorFlow. I had built the other one using Scikit. And, uh, and get a better handle on TensorFlow in general. Um, you know, some of the obvious hyperparameters are the long short-term memory units and the drop-off rate and stuff, but, uh, and I just haven't gotten there yet. Uh, I was building that, that what I just showed you. Because so I've been looking at that. I provided, uh, I provided a, a name in the chat, which is TensorBoard. With TensorBoard will allow you to uh, build visualizations on like how these hyperparameters work and where you're, you know, graph these performance over time. And they, it provides a lot of vis tools to help you suss out the information that you're looking for. So I'd strongly encourage you to figure out how to use it and put it to use. Yeah, I haven't gotten there yet. Let me uh, figure out how to build a TensorFlow model before I start figuring out how to use its measurement tools. And that's where I'm kind of going with this. But right now I was more focused on and getting something a little more uh, concrete uh, regarding a better model for them and then if they wanted to do custom wakeboard model I was prepared for that uh, anyway that's what I've been working on and then um, I spent a day or two um, understanding and documenting our data pipeline so so Gez I updated that PR 56 ticket with um, a link to the actual wiki page for the data pipeline which contains most of that knowledge I've transferred to there 
and I'll just explain that very briefly here. Um, we had a system in place. Well, well, let me put it this way. We have a system in place where whenever a device or our code running somewhere, I don't want to say device, because my laptop could be considered a device, I suspect. But whenever a wake word is believed to be detected, um, it is shipped to the cloud. Just caveat there, it's gonna be at best, as we saw from that uh, chart, 85% accurate. So it's, it's carrying with it a 15% negative bias already, right? That data finds its way into one big old subdirectory, which is on a network access device, a network access storage device. It's on mount NAS slash wake words. And thank you, Chris Fleur, uh, for spending the time with me to help me get on to these servers. Um, that in and of itself was not a trivial issue because it's, I guess, located in the Lawrence Data Center and not part of the Mycroft um, core machines. That being said, I don't really care about that. One thing that would be helpful would be to share, if possible, that mount with the Lambda 2 server. I don't know how difficult that would be to configure, but the rationale for that is that that NAS device has 18 terabytes of storage available, of which one terabyte is used, whereas Lambda 2, which is where the models are actually trained and produced, is down to a little under a terabyte of storage left. Um, and I could easily chaw up a terabyte or two here and there because our initial data set is a terabyte. Now, let me, let me get into a little bit of the pipeline as it exists and explain where we're at, and then I can explain what's gotta change. So right now that data goes to a server, which is running fine, it's a Flask uh, app. It accepts that audio and it stores the file, the WAV file, with a structured file name, as you pointed out, Josh, um, into that directory. The, Parameters for that file name are questionable at best. Uh, it carries a model identifier, which is this big honking string that I don't think has ever changed. It carries sessions, which I don't think are meaningful to anybody. The information it does contain that's meaningful is there is a user, uh, you know, SHA of some sort in there that I'm assuming Chris could tie back to users. That being said, the data gets dumped in its raw wave format with a restructured file name into this big old wake words directory. There currently exists over 1.6 million samples in that directory. So if LS on a directory of 115,000 hangs, this hangs a couple of orders of magnitude worse. Now, that being said, it also was at one point in time taking that data and storing it in a MySQL database in a somewhat structured manner. And that behavior discontinued around August of 2019. And the fallout from that is there's 1.6 million files in the directory and 1.1 million in the database. I touched base with Matt on that, but I didn't really have to, but I just verified some stuff. And somebody was manually running this, this sync script periodically. And that person no longer exists, and that sync script hasn't been run since August, which is not that big a deal, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, anyway, the point being made here is that we have a lot of data. However, it's not of any value since it's carrying at least a 15 or 20% error rate. So it certainly can't be used for training or testing until it's been manually validated, which there was a process in place for that, which I assume is no longer going on. I'm assuming that that process, because this is what Matt communicated to me, was responsible for producing the 114,000 samples we have in the TGZ that Gez shared with me. 
And um, those 114,000 samples, to the best of my knowledge, have been manually validated. Yes, this contains the wake word, or no, this sample doesn't. That's the layer of classification that was put on top of that, that raw data. And according to Matt, it was done by two people. If they were in agreement, it was fine. If they weren't, it was put back out there so that we could get a third. And that was the process. So that being said, I feel pretty confident that that 114,000 samples are, let's call it good data. The 1.6 million or let's say 1.5 million beyond that are of questionable value until they are manually validated or until such time as I can build some sort of classifier with a high enough confidence level that we could allow that data into a training set. Uh, that being said, uh, what I didn't do yet, because it's not clear to me just how much data I need yet, and Michael, we alluded to this last meeting, which is um, we don't know if we've reached the point of diminishing returns on the number or sample size yet of our data. And, and that's some of the experimentation I'll be doing this weekend, which is, okay, I'm, I'm using, I don't know, 50 or 60,000 out of the 114 a uh, thousand samples I have because that's what I was able to classify. What if I were to go back and reduce that even further and you know make it even higher confidence level? That these are high and low pitch voices and drop out a bunch and maybe only have twenty thousand. Would that be better? I, I suspect not. Uh, my my gut instinct tells me we're still at the point in time where more epics is good and more data is good. Obviously, you can reach some point where it becomes detrimental. I don't know that we've reached that yet, and I'll have to do some testing and look at loss and stuff like that over the weekend to see if we are there. Uh, and that applies to Epic as well. That being said, I'd like to, if we do decide that this is something we'd like to continue to pursue, which is the accumulation of more data, and it's not clear to me that we need more than 1.6 million samples, but if we decide to continue with that, I'd like to fix the process so that if I become a splotch on the side of the road tomorrow, my craft doesn't suffer and somebody manually running a sync task um, no longer doing that causes disruption. So I will basically um, go ahead and start pulling those files, moving them into subdirectories that represents sanity, sanity being somewhat less than 50,000 files in a directory. If there's less than 50,000 files in a directory, you can LS it, you can CAT it, find will work as advertised, um, and it doesn't take hours to come back from a uh, an LS or something. So, you know, I'm gonna break them up in the subdirectories of no more than 50,000 files in each one and modify the current process to have a cron that runs every night that would move today's samples into the, the latest directory until such time as that directory reaches 50,000, and then create a new directory and start sticking them there. Uh, not a major problem, uh, but you know something that I, I think might be worth it if we decide to continue to collect samples. Okay, uh, when, you, <laughs> when you throw that ticket, can you do me two additional favors? Um, one is uh, uh, one is uh, du the disk and make sure. Uh, well, as part of this nightly process. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. So I've I've had trouble in the past with people not not printing databases and stuff and having them new computers. So you know, as part of this process, you should du the disk, and if it's getting too close to the end of the disk, it should stop doing it or delete the oldest one or something, but it should not just keep filling it until the computer locks up. And then number two, if you could look at FLAC or some similar lossless compression mechanism and um, you know, crunch those waves down into something that's, that's easier to store, um, we may be able to save quite a lot of storage space. Uh, that 1.7 terabytes of, or that 17 terabytes of storage is actually eight 10 terabyte disks. So it's both mirrored and rated across two separate NASAs. So every bit that you write is actually four bits. Um, 
and it's all the storage that we've got for the time being. So if there are places where we can intelligently use compression, we should go ahead and do that. That being said, do not, you know, if it, if the wakeward stuff needs to be processed as wave files, let's not set ourselves up for a process where we have to decompress, you know, a terabyte of data before we run training. So, you know, balance the, the need to store it compressed with the need to train on it. Um, but those should both be part of whatever nightly process you're running. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm yeah. That, all makes, that all makes sense. What are you running on those, RAID 50s? I don't know what the question is. Well, 50 would be uh, mirrored and then RAID 5. Yeah, it's they're mirrored striped and then there's two NASAs running as identical mirrors of each other. So there's two separate NASAs, each one is mirrored and striped. Right, when you say mirrored and striped, I just wanna make sure because RAID, there's a lot of different, I actually wrote a lot of uh, RAID firmware. Uh, so my question is, when you say mirrored striped. and striped, so striped, you have, with, striped with redundancy, you can nuke any disk and it'll, it'll stand it back up. Yeah, so you have three drives, right, associated with each uh, sector, right? You have the parity drive that you can re recover any one of the three if they go down from the other two, correct? Yeah, it's four drives, but yeah, same same basic principle. Yeah, you can yeah, you can yeah. you can nuke any one of them and it'll keep working. Right, because you're also mirroring. Okay, cool. So you're running RAID 50. So that's awesome. Uh, what I was going to recommend. Uh, I worked at a company in the Silicon Valley when I made my Mecca out there, uh, which every programmer needs to do before he passes on. Um, and I worked for a company called Quantcast that processes about 50 petabytes of data a night. And they were leading um, uh, developers of high performance file systems for large data sets like this. Uh, they have the um, Quantcast file system, but more importantly, they were using Apache Spark, I believe, for large data sets. And that's kind of a buzzword that investors might want to hear that typically is associated with machine learning and large data sets. Do you want me to investigate migrating that data storage to a Spark system or no? Not at this time. We need to focus on making the Mark II actually work before we get into anything like that, but I think it's a good long-term ticket. Okay, good. All right, yeah, so just to, just to be clear, I'll, uh, I'll build a simple cron that will handle the, uh, the overflow uh, I will um, check the storage each day to make sure it's not getting too large, although I warn you, I would probably shut off gathering of data today since that drive is 90% full. Um, if we could NAS in the, uh, the large terabyte mount that we have uh, into um, Lambda 2, that would make it a lot easier because Lambda 2 is the one that's running out of disk space, number one, and number two is then we wouldn't have to transfer large amounts of data to build up training data sets. Kind of the whole concept of the index files I built was that the data just stays static wherever it was stored and then you pass around index files to reference it. Uh, so, you know, if we could get that mount onto that Lambda 2, that would be unbelievably awesome. Uh, but yeah, yeah other I than I'll look at what it takes to get that done, and you and I can have an offline discussion about whether or not that makes sense. Uh, it's going to depend on how you're accessing the data. In other words, if we have to move the entire data set over the network every time you want to train, then it may be quicker to just slap another disk on the box. No, what I'm saying is your Mount NAS is, is a network accessible storage drive. You just need to allow Lambda 2 to access it. Yeah, the but they're, they're, two mile, they're in buildings that are two miles apart. Mm, I don't think the electrons will care, but all right, I'll look into that. Anyway, um, yeah, so um, so that's where I'm at is, is managing the data pipeline. There's actually a wiki page that I cut for that, that I referenced in that ticket, Gez, that you, uh, that you did PR56 or whatever, and you can read up on what I found there. It, it has most of the information about the Lambda 2 server and the data storage server in the process and, and where I'm going with what, what it should become versus what it is. And I'll continue to update that document as I do that. And yes, Josh, I'll, I just made a note, create a ticket for, um, for the cron and stuff like that. So, okay. So yeah, that's where I'm at. I can give uh, a, another model which may be better. Uh, I can also speak with the developer and help him to fine tune it when he gets it installed uh, for their environment and um, and then we can take it from there. As far as long term, 
a better model goes, I think that's going to come with more analysis of the model and the hyperparameters and figuring out um, how to get control of that. And that's a little bit longer term out there for right now, I guess. Although I'm working on it. Okay, thanks, Ken. Um, yeah, that's a good update. That's that's um, sounds like you've got that under control. I'd like to um, yeah, let's make sure that uh, we are not approaching the limit of usefulness in, in terms of adding new samples to get a better system before we go ahead and try to find a way to utilize those 1.6 million samples. Um, yeah, I mean, the only way we're going to be able to utilize them is to go back to a business process flow where they're manually being validated. Yeah, exactly, right. So, and, you know, we're talking about standing up tools to do that anyway because we want to be able to generate new wake words. Uh, but uh, if it's not necessary, we've got lots of other things to work on. So Now, Michael, just so you know, um, and, I, and I understand the, the concerns here, having them create their own custom wake words on their own and letting them experiment with that might serve two purposes. It might, <laughs> I mean, they certainly can do it. It's not that difficult, and I can teach them how to do it in like an hour or two. Uh, it might keep them busy. <laughs> and, and then they develop a better appreciation for the model we ship them. <laughs> but, but, I mean, really, the, the only constraint on them training their own wake words would be their data samples, and that's entirely left up to them. I mean, I can even offer that if they want to ship me up, a, uh, you know, a uh, car file of samples. I'll train it for them and give a model back. It doesn't take that long. It's not that big a deal. So, yeah, that, that's you know, not really the, that's not the hurdle. I think it's the collecting the samples that's the hurdle and, you know, I mean, you can yeah, explain to them what the process is and how many they need. But... Yeah, I understand where you're coming from between the lines, and I won't go there. I'm just saying, just between you and me and the fence post, it's not that tough. Yeah, no, I, I know it's not the tough. It's just the data collection, and I don't think that, you know, I mean, there are companies that have formed their whole business model around building these wake words, right? So. Correct, correct. All right. All right, anybody have anything else on the bug fixing sprint? Can I just make a final point on that data stuff? Like anything that we do to the raw data, I want to be very careful that we're not doing something that can't be reverted, that we don't have a backup of the original data for. Like we don't want to do any compression or processing that's going to, that, that we don't have a backup of, I think. Yeah, so oh, that brings up a good point, by the way, Gaz. I, I should have mentioned this. Sorry. So I guess, <laughs> yeah. I guess the bottom line, Josh, regarding data integrity and, uh, and uh, privacy is up until last August, if somebody opts out, uh, if, we, if, if Chris can tie that person to the person identifier in the database, I can get rid of all their samples. Um, right now, I couldn't until all the data is moved out of that big directory because RM fails miserably on directories that large, as does LS. Um, once I had the data moved out into manageable subdirectories, then I could get rid of it in the absence of it being in the database. Does that make sense? In other words, I don't need the database since I know the structure of the file, and I could manually write code to manually go through and say, ah, this file belongs to this guy, this file belongs to this guy, this file belongs to this guy. Obviously, it'd be preferable to say, select file names where user is blah. But, you know, again, that's only going to cover up until last August. So once I get the data moved out into little subdirectories, I could certainly do that. Today, I could not guarantee you I could whack somebody's data if they asked us to. If yeah, I can I can. It's you just you string together a bunch of Linux commands. It's it's very doable. It's, I can never remember the exact syntax, but I just put a link up in the thing. You just search Stack Overflow. I documented. I put my scripts in the precise wiki as well on Confluent. Yeah, so it's it's available. It's it's just you can't use the out of the box tools. You kind of have to work around it. You know, Ken, you could use the file names as a guide. <clears throat> regarding how to organize the files. And then if you did like directories that took some of the filing parts out of it, you can sort the file name as well. No, 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 I, 
<laughs> I understand. What I would recommend is Gez and Josh, whatever you guys sent me, just go try it on your 1.6 million uh, file directory uh, and see what it actually does. Yeah, I can use head and stuff like that, but and I've definitely done. I mean, I actually you know wrote Python script. That's how I know I can tell you there's 1.6 million files in there. But if you're going to try to use sed and awk and grep and all that stuff on that directory, good luck. <laughs> okay, moving on. Oh, well, it does sound like um, there is a missing piece of our process here that's been highlighted. Since things are no longer in uh, being added to our database, and um, if we, you know, we supposedly have a system whereby we delete people's samples from the database if they turn off their opt-in, right? Um, have we been doing it? Do we have a system like that that is actually executing right now? Not, not, auto not automatically, but as far as I know, nobody flipped that bit, so we could go back and check. Right, okay. Well, yeah, we should create a ticket to actually implement that system if it's not currently running. We're not yeah, sharing this so data set with anybody a outside the company. In terms of like, should it be if someone turns off opt-in, does that mean that they and stopping opting in from now on, or does that mean that we delete all of their data that they ever contributed? I mean, from a business rules perspective, we want to nuke everything we've ever touched from that that end user. So if you hit opt out, your data's gone, right? Um, as quickly as we can do it. Um, the yeah. So Ken, when yeah. you're building, oh, numbers, you consider still building them oh. based on account ID because that way it would be very easy to find um, an account. But instead of having the trans transverse 1.6 million subdirectory or files and subdirectories, we could just find a subdirectory that has that account ID in it and just blow that away. Well, yeah, I don't know that I was going to, I'm not sure how I would want to partition the data yet. That was something that I was considering late last night before I went to sleep. Um, you know, but for right now, it's just going to start moving 50,000 at a time into directories. All I was getting at was if somebody said today, whack all my data, I couldn't. Once I get it broken out into directories of less than 50,000, I could. But today I could whack all their data up until last August. That's all I'm saying. Uh, in other words, I'll be prepared to do it should somebody decide they want to opt out. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mycroft Sprint 12, which is a kind of our bucket of things that don't really fit anywhere else. Uh, Selenium 68, I am going to, I have not seen any problems with the Selenium uh, release that's in test. So my plan is to tonight move that to uh, production. And then um, once that's been running for a little bit to add these new uh, metrics into our uh, new metrics website, so uh, this should be done soon. And while I'm doing things tonight, I'm also planning on doing this WordPress production droplet upgrade as well, since I'll be uh, doing things after hours. Um, so that is my plan for tonight. Hopefully, those two will get um, will get closed. Uh, upgrade Mattermost seems to be a new one. Is that, guys, did you put that one in there? Yeah, we, um, so we use the extended support releases or something like that uh, of Mattermost and the, the current one that we're on is uh, in, at end of life. Um, so there should be a new one out. It should have been yesterday. Um, I haven't checked if it's actually been released, but um, that should bring us through to, to mid-2021. Um, yeah, but then the other thing that we'll, we'll need to look at pretty pretty quickly is, uh, from my read, our license only extends to 5,000 users. 
um, which we're about to hit. So I need to do some testing to see, you know, if we, yeah, I need to do some more reading about what that, what's going to happen when we hit that 5,000, whether, you know, uh, whether there are deactivated think- accounts that, don't count towards it or yeah i think mattermost is uh free for for uh open source communities if i remember correctly um yeah we, we have to go to them periodically and and uh, get a new license key because it, it's free but you have to jump through some hoops okay but yeah let's there i know i've been on the phone with our ceo several times so we can just reach out and be like hey we need more more licenses. I think that's the way to handle it. But if it's not, then let's work out. We'll we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Cool. Sounds good. Um, But yeah, in terms of the upgrade, uh, Chris, I wondered if that's better sitting in your bucket. Sorry to do that to you. I remember just being a royal pain last time we did it, so... Um, it was a world of pain, did you say? Yeah, it was. It, it just was not a fun upgrade last time I did it. But, um, um, but yeah, we'll. Uh, I mean, I'm certainly keeping on my radar. Yeah, I don't but think yeah, we need I mean, to prioritize yeah. it. If it doesn't expire until October, then let's do it in September. No, no, no. The the, the one that we're on at the moment expired two days ago. Well, oh. yesterday. Sorry. I see. Yeah. There, there's two options. There's two ESR options. Okay, yeah, like I misread that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, ball. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I yeah. can look into this right. since it's already expired. I can. I mean, does it not? It's no longer supported. Does that mean it's not going to work, or is it just? No, it just means, no, it just means like it's um. <laughs> Yeah, 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 if some security issue came up tomorrow, then they wouldn't push a fix for it. Okay. I think we can probably safely delay this. We don't transmit any secure info over Mattermost, right? And not intentionally. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's not spend again, any time on know. this until we've got somebody who you know is dedicated to infrastructure stuff. Because, um, yeah, we're, it would, we're stretched it would just too be thin if, for this. If there was an actual vulnerability that like let people, you know, list the, um, uh, like it would have to be pretty bad to, to really be an issue. But, um, and I'm sure it would be reported still. I think it's safer if we move off it, you know, when we can. Um, but I don't think that's happened today for sure. All right. Um, Anything else? Yeah, that's it for the uh, that's it for the sprint. Okay. So um, normally that would be the end of the meeting, but because I like really long meetings, I was going to drag it out a little bit. Um, and... Sounds like fun. <laughs> Is anybody still listening to this? <laughs> Actually, uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to do is actually discuss uh, how we might make these meetings a little bit more efficient. So um, the DevSync is, uh, you know, this is something that we started doing, I don't know, I guess you guys started doing it last year um, to just stay in touch. Uh, and I think it's a good idea, but I think that we should, um, you know, there's a, a fair number of issues that come up that aren't really pertinent to the whole team. Um, like when we're talking about like Mattermost upgrades or um, anything having to do with like standing up a new server or something like that. So I'm wondering if we should um, have another, I don't know, if those are things that can just be communicated one-on-one directly and resolved that way. Um, and uh, and we can kind of keep this to issues that uh, involve the whole team. So like the precise stuff, I know not everyone's working on precise, but like it's it's critical, I think, and I think everybody should know what's going on there. Um, so I know that eats up uh, a lot of our time on these meetings, but but like I said, I think I think it's important. I think everybody needs to know what's you know what's happening. Um, 
And uh, you know, likewise with the Mark II, I want to keep everybody up to date on the hardware side of things. Um, but um, that's my opinion. What do you guys think? Uh, before we get into that, I would need to throw a wrench. So uh, if we think we are in possession of data for people who have opted out, we do need to move that right up to the top of the priority list. So I just sent you an email and said, basically, um, one, we need a process that when they flip the bit, we nuke it off. Number two, we need an audit process because we're not keeping the historic state of that bit. In other words, we don't know if somebody used to opt in and is now opt out. We need an audit script in case that fails uh, at the time they hit the button. So if they hit the opt out button and for whatever reason our systems are down or they don't communicate or we have a bug or whatever and their stuff doesn't get nuked, we need an audit system to come back through every 24 hours or 48 hours, verify the states of those bits. And then if there is something in the directory that belongs to that user who has now opted out, we need to reach out and nuke it. And then item three, we need to run the script I just talked about and item two, basically right now. Because what we what we just heard is we very well might be in possession of data for people who have opted out. Um, so we need to reach into the system and, and take care of that. Um, uh, so can, can Gez, can you and Bayer and um, Ken get together and figure out how to provide Ken with a list of those unique hashes? And then we can simply run a, I mean, we can hand jam this the first time out. We can just run a script that basically says, you know, any of those hashes that are opt out, if we've got them anywhere in that directory, we're gonna nuke that file. I mean, something quick and dirty, but like I said, we just found out we may be in possession of data we're not explicitly authorized to have. So we do need to move that to the top of the priority list. Yeah. Or it took me a minute to think that through. Yeah, this is Salini issue 83, uh, which I logged a few minutes ago. So um, yeah, I agree with Josh. We should get on this. Okay. Chris, I'll get with you first thing in the morning and give you some um, user SHAs and you see if you can reverse, determine who they're associated with so that we can then do that mapping, okay? Yeah, I'll certainly do that. And if the SHA is there, is different from the SHA we keep on the database. I'm sorry. Okay, go. We'll need to, I'm not sure what we'll, we'll figure something out because if we can't backtrace that data to who it is, um, it'll be a big problem. Yeah, I'm thinking we can. I'm thinking we can. It's the account ID that's coming from Mycroft Corp. Okay. Yeah, my, if I wrote it, there's a good chance that two things happened. I grabbed the account ID and then I wrote a salt to it so it's non reversible and then I hashed it. So you need to find the code where I salt that and figure out what the salt string is in order to figure out who it is. Okay. I almost, I, if I wrote it, it's almost certainly salted. Well, that's the, that's going to make it a little more challenging, Chris. <laughs> yep. Find the code. The salt string is probably static. Um, so once you know what it is, it'll be easy, but, um, Otherwise, it's easy to run collision attacks against it, right? If you don't salt it. I uh, yeah, I I'll double check. I do not think it's being salted. Um, I think it's just plain. Hey, this is the account ID. This is the session ID. This is the time. This is the model identifier. Bam, concatenate them. Dot wave. I'll uh, okay. like I said Chris. I'll get with you in the morning on that and give you some samples yeah. and we'll see where we can go. Okay. Sounds good. All right, then I guess that concludes our meeting for today. And did you decide how we're going to shorten this meeting, or did oh, we you're right, we didn't. Uh, well, <laughs> I was going to I was going to shorten it by ending it. But... You want to cancel the meeting already? I thought we were going to extend it. <laughs> uh, so I think so. My input there is part of this meeting was to keep. You, Michael, up to date with what's going on um, mm -hmm. in Oliver. So I mean, we could go over less things, but I would be worried that something you know you wanted to know might be <laughs> uh, glossed over as well. Uh, so you know, if we, as long as we had decent uh, parameters as to, you know what what we can do, you know on the DL <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and what really requires, you know, your knowledge and attention, I think that would probably help. Okay. Well, documentation is good for that. You know, emails, it's easy to CC somebody on the, 
Um, if, you know, discussions that matter most, I can see those. Um, How's about a radical idea? I'm, I'm down with radical ideas. What do you think? During of this meeting, why don't you spend no more than five minutes a person? Tell us what you did yesterday, what you're planning on doing today, what you're blocked on, and if there's anything that's really worth sharing with the rest of the team that you've learned. And then we can keep these down around a half an hour. That's a, it's a good idea. It's a very typical stand-up meeting um, you know, philosophy. But I, part of the problem we're having now is that we kind of get off on tangents, right? I mean, you know, a ticket gets opened and we, we just kind of go off on this thing for 15 minutes. Um, you know, before we get back around to what we were talking about. So probably the first thing we should do is identify our tangents early. Um. <laughs> I, I think that's, yeah, but I think that's an artifact of the fact that we just kind of open up the project board and go, here's all the projects, let's talk about them. Versus this is what I specifically worked on. <laughs> so I just, uh, I think we open ourselves up to this. <laughs> that's my personal opinion. Well, I mean, I feel like the project board should accurately reflect what we're working on if we're using it properly, you know? And I think that's part of the problem is like, this is probably also a push of let's use the tools that we're, say that we're using to the to the best that we can. Um, and, you know, keep discussions about those tickets in the tickets. And, you know, that, that will help that process of keeping Michael informed as well. You know, if, if there's actually the discussion about that thing in the ticket, then he can go in there at any time and, and have a look at what's going on. And we can we can flag it quickly in this meeting that like, you know, the discussion's there if you want to take a look. Um, but we don't have to go into the the detail of it necessarily. Another thing I've I've been considering is moving from this um, scrum type uh, type boards to more of a Kanban type board. I've been reading um, a little bit about this and the fact that, you know, that the scrum, um, the, the scrum procedures don't really fit how we're doing things. Um, you know, as far as you know, a sprint and all that kind of stuff, we're really kind of doing things more in a Kanban way where, you know, we have these are the prioritized tasks and you just pick them off one by one. Um, so maybe, you know, just reorganizing a little bit how we, how we do this. Well, I think I, our computers are spread really thin. You know, right now, we, or do we, we've got five or six things going on. If we, <laughs> you know, we were a little more focused on, you know, we're doing bug fixes or we're doing, um, you know, one or two things, I think that would probably help the meeting go a little slower as well. Or, I'm sorry, a little faster as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've, I've done Kanban extensively, actually, and um, I don't think we fit it uh, for what we have. Kanban is a pull technology where you go up to the board, you have fungible assets, and the next fungible asset pulls off the next task that all fungible assets could do could, could accomplish. We, we are specialized somewhat here. I, I couldn't pick up Cellini tomorrow. So it's not really a good fit for us at this point in time. Now, that being said, I mean, Atlassian has Kanban boards built into it, and it's, it's pretty cool. And I, I certainly like the bottom-up approach to Kanban. I just don't think we fit that model yet. Well, I mean, you, you could pick off the next tick, ticket that you could do, right? I mean, it, I understand the, the idea behind it that anybody could pick off any ticket, but in our reality, you know, you pick off the next ticket that's the highest priority that you, you know, you could do. And I think there, there would have to be some, uh, you know, communication about, you know, who's, what's expected of each person and, you know, what the, what the I, priority is. Yeah, I don't really see how that's much different or any different from what we're doing now because we're treating it sort of like a Kanban, like we've got the list of open bugs and you're just picking off the next one that you can do. Uh, but we've also well, divided it into projects because some of these projects are discrete. Well, you can have multiple Kanban boards. You can have, you know, one sure. you know, per project. But sure. So but we're calling Kanban, but we're using a Scrum uh, tool for it right now. <laughs> yeah, the concept for Kanban is that changes come from the bottom up, right? The canonical example is 
you're in a car factory, your job is to take, as an assembly comes down the assembly line, your job is to take a door from a stack of doors behind you, bolt it onto the car, and down it goes. And you turn around and you notice you're out of car doors. So now you have to go and pick them up. And maybe one of the recommendations you would make in the Kanban meeting was it would be better if there was a blue ticket four doors down. And when somebody saw that, as they were making their rounds, they would magically replenish my door supply so I don't have to continue to do it and take time off going over and picking them up and forklifting them over and getting resources. But it's a ground up recommendation for how to improve the process flow. And I just don't know how that applies here. We're, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying in a yeah. negative manner, but we're being driven from the top down. Interesting. Yeah, but uh, Scrum doesn't really fit us either because they're not really doing sprints necessarily. We're just, you know, the buying project. Yeah, well, the whole purpose of Scrum is just a daily, hey, uh, five minutes, what are you working on? Let everybody know. Uh, if, you, if you're stuck on something, let us know. Uh, did you learn anything? Great. No, good. Great. Move on. Usually the board speaks for themselves, and if um, upper management like Michael or Josh have any questions, they can pull the individuals associated with the project aside and ask how they're going. This doesn't necessarily have to be the forum for that. Yeah. Uh, just like so, no, I'm flex. I don't... so thinking about this, you know, you're, you're right there, uh, Chris. I think the, the point of these meetings is not hopefully not to communicate facts because that's what should be all captured in the ticket system or, or whatnot, right? Um, the point of this, this meeting should be to uh, facilitate communication where we have questions or need, you know, need some sort of interaction and, um, you know, to highlight that stuff. So maybe uh, we can go back through, or maybe I'll go back through this, the recording here and just see what kind of interactions we're having and see, um, you know, where we're just relaying information that doesn't, you know, doesn't need to be relayed in a meeting of, you know, all hands like this. And, um, and then maybe we can focus the discussion on just the things that are, you know, causing people problems or might be, might be new information. Yeah, I think, yeah, I agree. One thing I've also found difficult in these is to, um, to tell what, is done with some of these like our if you look at these like a fixed existing bug spring i mean this list is huge and knowing what got added to it since we talked last yeah well um, we haven't been rolling it over every week right so we could close it yeah. out every week and make a new sprint like we had been doing with the generic sprint 11 12 things so yeah. i think if that's not too much trouble to do then let's just do that yeah we can make seven yeah like every week we could have a different fixed existing bug sprint yeah exactly Okay, maybe we'll do that thing because this is yeah, this is getting a little unwieldy. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Okay. Should we then, um, like, if we want to, if we want to double down on the sprint kind of process, um, should we have a you know future fix existing bugs list backlog, um, and you know what we're doing in this in this week or in this sprint. Because at the moment, mm -hmm. just yeah, basically saying. everything that could get fixed, you know, into one thing. Yeah, the concept for sprints is kind of misplaced. I hate to say it, but it's kind of misplaced mm. on us as well. Because the whole purpose of it is to get the, um, the person that owns the project to give you feedback at the end of the sprint and give you direction for what the next sprint should be doing. Uh, you know, you may have thought for the next three sprints you're going to be working on blah. And after one sprint, you know, the owner... The, the stakeholder says, well, you know, now I see where we're at. Do this instead of that, right? So it's to be agile. So you can you can swap and change on the fly what you're working on um, to meet the needs of the customer. We don't really get that feedback, right? We don't, we don't have any product owner saying, okay, now that you've done this, I think this is the next thing you should do. So, you know, the concept of sprints is almost lost on this team, right, to a certain extent. I, I agree. I agree with the, yeah, we don't have a customer per se. Um, but I still think it makes sense to have, you know, weekly or biweekly or, you know, regular objectives, right? I mean, we don't, you know, I hate to say this, but we don't even have a schedule for when we're going to be done with the Mycroft core software being ready to ship, right? 
there's just so many features that and we're so understaffed for the the amount of work that we have to do that you know kind of even planning that right now is kind of pointless um so you know we're just trying to uh tackle the low-hanging fruit um, and make as much progress as quickly as we can yeah I mean, it, may, it may make sense to be more organized about this when we have a bigger team and you know let's put some of this stuff up in a more you know, more organized fashion but i agree with people right now it's just kind of a you know let's get this this thing that identified to some of these things kind of quickly as possible i don't there's not it's really hard to time box some of these things too um one of the things i don't like about sprints is that they you know you can you can say that it's going to take me a, a day or two to do this task and i have these four tasks to do this week but um more times than not um you know it takes you longer to do something <laughs> than you think it will um and then it just winds up goofing up the whole you know schedule if you try to keep to a schedule um or you wind up you know doing bad things at the end of the week to call a, a task done when you know it's better to spend an extra day or two on it to get it um done the right way right so anyway yeah. well, um i mean I, I, the other the other point of having regular check-ins like this is just to make sure that people aren't you know uh, stuck. yeah make sure people aren't stuck or you know uh wandering off off target right so <laughs> um so well, I, you know on that and, front i think we're doing all right yeah and historically we i don't think we've gone deep enough so there are what we're discovering as we're digging into precise is that we were not near as you know at least i was not near nearly as on top of how these things were developing as i should have been because i was wandering around raising money and you know the the responsible the parties that were responsible for making sure that this stuff was done properly weren't doing their job yeah definitely seems that way so all right um let's let everybody go and um we'll uh probably try something a little bit different for our next meeting all right sounds like a plan all right <laughs> thanks everyone have a good weekend right, see you next week. i'll do soon